I'm Carlos. I work in Security UX in Chrome, and today I'll give the Security 101 or Intro to Security uh, class, class session. Uh, first of all, I want to say I adapted these slides from some made by Chris Palmer and Emily Stark, so thanks Emily and Chris for giving me the starter slides to begin with. Uh, with that being said, uh, today I'm going to tell you a bit about the security architecture and the guiding principles for Chrome. Uh, and then we'll give you, I'll give you a quick overview of what it's like to work with the security team uh, and what are the cases where you will likely work with the security team. Uh, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Uh, there, there should be plenty of time, but if anything goes unanswered, uh, I'll, I'll get to the questions in the Dory or someone else in the security team will get to the questions in the Dory before. Oh, with that being said, uh, that's the link to the Dory if anyone has any questions that, that you want to ask in the meantime. Uh, okay. Uh, so first, I'll talk a bit about general security principles, and then we'll we'll talk about how they apply to Chrome. Uh, so the in order to understand what a security mechanism is, we have to understand what trust is. And the main thing here is that when you trust an entity, it, it can break your expectations. So if you don't trust an entity, uh, there's nothing to break. But once you start trusting it, it can break that trust that you're giving it. Uh, and then a security mechanism has to do at least one of those three things that you see here on the slide. And ideally, a good, a good security mechanism uh, should not regress any of the other ones. Uh, unfortunately, not everything that's sold as a security mechanism is a net positive. That, that is, some will do one of these things, but then regress the two to a point where you're worse off than, than where you started. Uh, much of this slide deck will discuss how we how we try to do these things in Chrome. Uh, so let's start with the definition of security. Uh, it's the system behaves correctly the way that, that stakeholders expect, even when it's being sabotaged. That is, even when someone's trying to make it not behave correctly. Uh, this is hard because correctness to begin with is hard, uh, and security is just another layer of more hardness on top. Uh, so the work that we do is a bit fun. Uh, so I'll talk a bit now about how this applies to Chrome. Uh, so let's go back to the definition. Uh, so in the case of Chrome, we have multiple stakeholders. We have us implementing Chrome, we have the users, and we have websites, and we have we got, uh, other stakeholders. Uh, so how do we decide who we focus on? Well, we go by the HTML design principles uh, that, of the W3C, which is users over outers, over implementers, over specifiers, over purity. Uh, if you take one thing from this slide, it's just that we try to focus on keeping the user safe over everything else. And then we follow this order if need be. Uh, the, the, our goal as a, as a security team is to establish Chrome as the most trustworthy implementation of the open web platform. That is to comply with all the OWP uh, security mechanisms to implement them correctly and to be, try to be the least buggy or the, the least likely to let attackers uh, harm you. Uh, so now that I mentioned the open web platform uh, security mechanisms, I'm going to talk a bit more about those and, and define the web security model. Uh, the web security model is actually kind of crazy. Uh, the web security model aims to enable you to visit any website and allow you and allow the website to run code on your computer, JavaScript code to be specific. Uh, and even if the site is under control of an evil attacker, or if it's either because it's just owned by an attacker or because it's compromised right now, uh, we aim to let you navigate away or close a tab and escape completely unharmed. Uh, this is what makes it potentially very, but this is what makes uh, web applications very powerful, and they also and also makes them potentially very scary. Uh, so each website shouldn't be able to influence anything beyond its own control and any resources that you explicitly give it. Uh, downloads will be an exception to this, because downloads do persist in your computer and can cause lasting harm. Uh, in the case of downloads, Chrome tries to protect users by giving you enough information to decide whether or not you should download from that particular site, as I'll talk in, in a bit of the later slides. Uh, so this is something that makes the web awesome as a platform, but it's also something that makes working on, on browser and web security important and very challenging. Uh, so how do we manage, how does, how does Chrome manage this feed? Well, the fact that the code is managed is, is, is a big part of it. Uh, in this case, managed means that the code is memory safe, uh, the JavaScript is memory safe, uh, in theory at least. As you can see, if you attend uh, Security 201, uh, there are bugs sometimes that make this not to be the case. Uh, the code is garbage collected, and the code is not arbitrary machine code running your computer. That is, it's not native code running your computer. It's running towards Chrome, and Chrome can decide what, what runs and what shouldn't. Uh, besides being, besides, besides be keeping the code safe, uh, there's also a thing that's called the same origin policy. Uh, what is this? Well, 
It's a form of isolation between websites. Uh, if you go to some website.com, which might be evil, it can't read or manipulate data or state from any other website, like say google.com, nor use permission gated APIs that you ran it to google.com. Uh, in this case, the browser is, is, is responsible for enforcing this isolation. The spec defines the isolation, but, but, but each browser is responsible on implementing it correctly. Uh, since I mentioned origins, uh, I'll take a bit here to explain what an origin is. Uh, an origin is just a combination of the URL scheme, that is HTTP or HTTPS, the host, uh, and the port that it's running on. And unless all of these are equal, we consider two URLs to be different origins. So in the slide, you can see a few origins that look similar. Well, for the first three, they look similar, uh, but are actually treated as completely different origins for security purposes. So one of those will then be able to access resources from the other. Um, Okay, hey, so uh, all this isolation is great. Oh, excuse me. All this isolation is great, uh, but we also, so even if this is implemented correctly, uh, we also have to assume that there are attackers in the network. Uh, and in the presence of network attackers, we have at least two problems. Uh, for one, we can have passive attackers that can read anything you send to the server, and anything that sends back to you, the server sends back to you. So that is, they can eavesdrop on all the communications. Uh, and we also have active network attackers, which we usually call person in the middle, uh, that can alter anything you send to the server or anything the server sends back to you. That is, they can impersonate other servers, they can impersonate data that you're sending to the server, and, and the like. Uh, and on the internet, we have to assume that these network attackers are always present. And realistically, they likely are. Uh, in particular, you can get from this that active attackers, that is, those that are acting as a person in the middle, uh, can subvert the same origin policy. Uh, they can also do whatever they want with the resources from just one origin, because they can pretend to be that origin, as we'll talk about it in, in a minute, uh, which has very deep implications for user uh, permissions for anything the user grants to sites. We'll, we'll talk a bit more about how, that, how it affects that later. Uh, so what do we do to uh, protect ourselves against these network attackers? Well, some URL schemes like HTTPS for websites and WSS for web sockets use transport layer security, which we'll describe, to provide uh, three benefits. Those are server authentication, data integrity, and data confidentiality. Uh, the TLDR is server authentication is proving that the server you're talking to is the server that you think you're talking to. Uh, data confidentiality is uh, preventing any eavesdropper or any passive attacker to see the data. And data integrity is preventing any active attacker from actually manipulating that data and changing what you get from the server, what you send to it. Um, how does this work? Well, with cryptography, TLS will only expo expose a ciphertext to the network attacker. That is, they can still see what you send to the server, but they just can't understand it or read it. Uh, in a similar vein, they can an, an active attacker they can still alter the contents that are coming from the send from the server or that you're sending to the server, uh, but we will detect that the contents have been modified and just drop the connection. So we can prevent those two things, but we can just make them completely pointless. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll go a bit more into how the server authentication works in the, in the following slides. Uh, uh, so how do they work? Uh, to get some clues, let's look at the security, uh, the security panel in DevTools, which is what you can see in the slide. Uh, if you click that button that says, does that work? Yeah, be a certificate there, uh, it takes you to this. Uh, I wasn't able to resize that, so it looks a bit small, but focus on the part on top where it says certificate hierarchy. Uh, that's the certificate chain. And a certificate chain is just a, a, a string of certificates which is signed and vouched for the next one. Uh, so each certificate contains a public key, metadata about how the key is to be used, and a signature proving that someone else, in this case the previous certificate, uh, believes that the metadata, uh, that someone else believes that this, this data is true. Uh, so in the case here that I'm showing, the, the one up top is GeoTrust Global CA. That one comes with the operating system in this case. That one trusts Google Internet Authority, and Google Internet Authority trusts any site.google.com. Uh, so the chain of trust is you trust your operating system certificate store because you have to because that, that's where the trust starts. Uh, your operating system vendor trusts the operators of GeoTrust to issue certificates for any site on the internet. That's, that's why they include it. Uh, the operators of GeoTrust themselves uh, trust the operators of Google Internet Authority to issue certificates for any site on the internet. And finally, the operators of Google Internet Authority trust the operators of anything.google.com. Uh, in practice, Google Internet Authority will not, uh, and as far as I know, uh, has never issued certificates for any site on the internet, just for Google properties. 
But the operators of GeoTrust have to trust Google Internet Authority to sign certificates for any site because there's no technical enforcement that Google Internet Authority uh, will never issue certificates for any other site. Uh, so your operating system trusts many trust anchors or root CAs that come included with the, with the operating system. But there is a problem. Like I mentioned, any of them can sign certificates for literally any website, even if the website does not want their certificates issued by that certificate authority. And as you can imagine from what I'm showing here, this has happened. Sometimes it's a legitimate CA that is compromised. And sometimes they just make a mistake. And other times, the platform vendor proves untrustworthy and includes a malicious trust anchor in the platform. Uh, so what can we do about this? Well, one approach to the problem that was actually invented here at Google, excuse me, is to have the browsers require that any issuance of certificates occur in the public view and leaves an audit trail. Uh, that way, any attacker that wants to use uh, misuses, uh, they just create a trail, uh, and the misuses is likely to be more caught fast and the certificate revoked. We call this certificate transparency. Uh, the goal is to have any issuance occur in at least one public log and then have browsers check for proof that certificates are in at least one public log before accepting a certificate and just rejecting the certificate and dropping the connection otherwise. Uh, the logs are cryptographically, cryptographically verified, and they are append only, so there can be no tampering. That is, the certificate cannot be included and then removed from the log without breaking the integrity from the log. Uh, the example here is what certificate transparency logs know about PayPal.com certificates. So you can see uh, all certificates that have been issued for PayPal.com. Um, OK, so back when I started talking about why this is important, I mentioned user permissions. So let's go back to that and as to why HTTPS is important and the transport security is important in general. Uh, so consider the certificates that you grant any site. Uh, here are a few of them in the, in the page info panel. Uh, most of them are actually not meaningful unless you're granting them to a secure origin. If you're granting them to a non-secure origin, uh, you're pretty much granting it to any origin. That is, if you grant something like, say, use of your location to http://example.com, uh, any site could be could abuse the fact that you trust this site. Well, any attacker can abuse the site that you trust this site. Men in the middle of it, and then uh, just use just use the fact that you trust it to gain access to whatever you trusted it with. Uh, that's that's why we say we're they're, they're meaningless. Uh, so for this reason. Chrome is heavily invested in the adoption of HTTPS across the web and has been pushing more sites to move to HTTPS. Uh, improving HTTPS adoption is an ecosystem-wide project. It's not something that Chrome can do by itself. Uh, for our part, we build developer tools, browser UI, and analysis tools to tackle this problem, to convince sites to move to HTTPS. Uh, fortunately, HTTPS usage is slowly but steadily rising, and you can see in the right on the graph that it's now hovering around 70% across all platforms, which is a fairly large increase from 2015. Uh, so what does this mean that we're pushing for HTTPS usage for you as a Chrome engineer? Well, if you're building a new web platform feature, consider how an attacker might have used it, and consider making it only available to HTTPS sites. Uh, in fact, this is an actual policy, as you can see in, the, in this screenshot, uh, that features that we classify as powerful have to be limited to secure sites only to protect the users. Uh, if you remember, uh, when there's an active network attacker, any non-secure origin is essentially one big non-secure origin, because any attacker can uh, just change the data to be whatever they want. So this means that if a user trusts httpexample.com, as I mentioned, with your location, uh, the, the attacker can just get it. Moreover, uh, an attacker can combine all the all the permission-gated APIs that you've granted to different HTTP sites and just create and just abuse all of those to get literally all the permissions that you've granted to any of them. Um, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so we, in order to prevent that, we try to limit powerful features to HTTPS only, and this will come up when your feature is going for a security review. So I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, okay, so let's go back to Chrome and talk about how these mechanisms uh, are, are implemented in Chrome. Uh, so enforcing an ambitious security model like the one that I talked about requires defense in depth. Because Chrome is millions and millions of lines of C++ code, and we have to assume that there are bugs in, in, in the code. Uh, and in fact, there are bugs in the code. And some of those bugs will be in the way that the that browser <laughs> parses, runs, and renders sites. Uh, that is, parses the HTML or runs the JavaScript. Uh, for example, the JavaScript engine might have a bug where it allows a window from one site to control contents in the, the window of another site which is clearly not allowed by the same origin policy that I talked about earlier, uh, even though that shouldn't be allowed. Or the HTML parser might have a typical memory corruption vulnerability, like a buffer overflow, uh, so a malicious site can serve HTML that, that, that allows them to run uh, 
native code in your computer. If you want to see an example of this, uh, you can go to the Security 201 presentation that Adrian will give today in the afternoon, where he will uh, go deeper into how this is possible. So one of the, the ways that we try to limit uh, the impact of any of such bugs is through process isolation and sandboxing. Uh, what are those? So Chrome is actually made of many operating system level processes. Sorry, my screen is weird. Um, Chrome is made of different uh, operating system level processes. And the content like HTML and JavaScript runs in what we call renderer processes, which are sandboxed. That is, their privilege uh, level is limited. So if uh, an attacker gains control of renderer processes, the effect that they can take in your computer is much more limited. They are limited in, in things like installing software or doing arbitrary network requests. As opposed to that, anything that runs in the browser process is higher privileged and can do those things. Uh, so that is, that, is, that, is, that is what process isolation means. Well, that is what sandboxing means in this case. Uh, for this reason, we prefer that all code that's, power, that's powerful and likely to, con to contain vulnerabilities remains, or anything that deals with untrustworthy inputs, remains in the renderer process as opposed to the browser process. Uh, one thing here is that browser processes and, network and renderer processes can communicate through IPC or inter-process communication. Uh, we have to be very careful when designing these messages, because if we allow the browser process to act on the render on behalf of the renderer process and the renderer process is compromised, this will cause the browser process to uh, pretty much run any code that the compromised uh, process uh, wants it to run, uh, therefore causing, uh, like, losing the effectivity of sandboxing. Um, another way that we deal with the inevitability inevitability of bugs in software, specifically in C++, is to proactively try to find them and fix them. Um, one way we do that is by uh, rewarding external reports. Another way that we do that is through what we call cluster fuzz. A uh, sub-team of Chrome security works in, in, in this system, which automatically finds and reproduces bugs with uh, fuzzing. Fuzzing is running uh, different pieces of code with random inputs, trying to find memory corruption and other type of crashes that can lead to security issues. Uh, cluster fuzz constantly runs on thousands of cores, uh, throwing all sorts of test cases to Chrome and looking for those crashes that I mentioned. Those test cases can be generated randomly, or they can also be evolved from a set of seed test cases, therefore evolving the coverage and increasing the coverage over time. Uh, Clusterfuzz has already found thousands upon thousands of security bugs in, in, in Chrome, which is pretty cool. Uh, so in the course of working in Chrome, you might notice that Clusterfuzz finds a bug in code that you wrote, and either a security team member triages it, triages it and decides that it's slightly related to your code and assigns it to you, or if Clusterfuzz can confirm that it was caused by a seal that you landed, Clusterfuzz will automatically assign it to you. Excuse me. Uh, if this happens, we really appreciate your help in fixing and finding the, the in finding and fixing the bug as soon as possible. Uh, uh, one of the core principles in Chrome is that security is the responsibility of the whole team, not just those of us working in the security team. Uh, so if you get a cluster fast bug, you'll get something that looks like this report. Uh, the main thing to focus here will be the link on top with, where it says the detail report. If you click that one, it will send you to the detail report. And here we can focus on the three uh, circle, the three green circle parts here. Uh, so you can see the minimized test case one at the top. If you click that one, it will show you the HTML file that Clusterfast was running when it uh, found when it triggered the crash. So this is what, what you can use to reproduce the crash in your own code and try to figure out what's going on. Uh, you also see the revision range where this regressed. Uh, in this case, that is the, the, the range of CLs that landed in the period where the bug regressed. This is where, if there's only a single CL, Clusterfuzz will automatically assign the bug to the owner of that CL. And at the bottom, you can see the crash trajectories. Uh, in that case, it's, it's the, the series of functions calls that, that led to the crash. So this is also useful when debugging, especially if you happen to not be able to reproduce locally. Uh, in any case, if this is not sufficient, or if you don't know how to deal with, with, with a bug that Clusterfuzz assigned to you, feel free to contact the security team, and we, we can help you. Um, figure out what's going on. Uh, so with that being said, I want to talk a bit about what, what's the difference between handling security bugs as opposed to uh, other non-security related bugs. Uh, so if a non-security bug is a non-regression and it has already been unstable for a while, there's a valid argument that we've lived with this for a bit, maybe we've lived for it, with it for a bit more, uh, and we down-prioritize it and work on higher priority stuff. With security bugs, this shouldn't be the case. Because if the bug is unstable, even because even if the bug has been unstable for a while, uh, the longer it's unstable, it's the longer that our users are exposed to it, and the more likely that an attacker is to find it. Uh, so we can address those as soon as possible, even if we can see that it's not a recent regression. For a similar reason, uh, with crash bugs, uh, when crash bugs are not a security issue, uh, if you look at the crash metrics and the crash bug is not happening very often in the wild, 
a, it's fine to say, well, this is this doesn't happen very often. We can work on higher priority stuff or on bugs or on crashes that happen more often. Uh, with security bugs, that's not the case because even if a crash is not being hit in the wild often, uh, an attacker can craft HTML or JavaScript that causes it to happen and then uh, exploits that. So we also want to address those as soon as possible, even if they're not being hit much. Uh, when you get a bug that's a security bug that's uh, reported by an external reporter, it's perfectly fine to pick on them for more data, like more better reproduction steps, uh, get an opinion on the fix, uh, anything that you need from them. Because we pay those users through the vulnerability rewards program, and we pay higher amounts for better reports. So it's both in yours and the external reporter's best interest to, to uh, get a, a higher quality report in, in the bug. Uh, and finally, we should prioritize merging security bug fixes as soon as possible. So as soon as the fix lands, we want to start the merge process and get it get it merged into stable uh, as soon as possible. Because the bug pretty much becomes public the minute that you land the fix. An attacker can just see the seals that landed and see that they're related and, and try to determine if they're related to a security bug. And if you have a test case, that's actually a, pretty much a reproduction case. Uh, so we want to merge those as soon as possible. Uh, well, so. Let's assume now that we had perfect code and that everything, uh, we fix all our bugs really quickly, our code never fails, uh, we even force everything perfectly. Well, even if we had everything perfect and, and that, that was all working, the sad reality is that it's still fairly easy for users to get tricked on the web. And all the work that I described so far and all our uh, due diligence and fixing bugs will not protect users if they get tricked into giving up their sensitive data, uh, including credentials, data, uh, privileges, or credit card numbers, et cetera. Uh, this example here is your typical phishing email in which a user clicks a link uh, and then they enter their Google account password thinking that they're legitimately changing their password when in reality they're giving the password to an attacker which will be able to log in as them. Uh, so what do we do to prevent those? Well, one way that we try to protect users is with safe browsing interstitials like this, which we show when we believe a site is a phishing site or when it's distributing malware or it's being compromised in, in, in some other way. Uh, so. This one also shows a bit of what we uh, have as a, as a security UI design principles. You can see that we give a simple explanation to the user where they can understand, well, pretty much we believe the site is, is trying to trick you uh, as opposed to something highly technical. We use what we call opinionated UI, uh, that is the safe choice, in this case, back to safety, which just takes you back to the previous site, is the, the most immediate and more obvious thing to click. Uh, you have to actually click advanced details to, to get even the, the override available. But we do have that override available because we respect users who want the override and uh, decide that they know what they're doing in this case. Uh, I want to highlight that we do extensive research when implementing any new security UI or when we're changing existing UI that's security sensitive to make sure that we're providing the right information to users. And in the case where we're using opinionated UI, we also do research to make sure that this is having the effect that we that we expect as opposed to the opposite effect or uh, no effect at all. Uh, with that being said, now that we covered a bit about, about the guiding principles, I'm going to talk a bit about interacting with the security team that is with us uh, and how we can make this easier. Uh, the security team is a loose group of people that are working on many different areas of security. These are some of the security teams here on the slide. Uh, I talked about some of these teams and what they do today, uh, but unfortunately, I didn't have time to cover all, all the areas that everyone is working on. And as you work on Chrome, you'll have many opportunities to work with the security team and learn more about how we uh, try to keep our users safe. And we're actually quite friendly, and we don't want you to be blocked on us. So I'll try to talk a bit about how uh, to not get blocked on us when you're working with us. Uh, so if we go back to the first section, I talk a bit about inter-process communica inter communication and why this is important and why this has to be reviewed. Uh, so whenever you change uh, inter-process communication message, that is a Mojo message or an IPC message, uh, you'll have to get a security reviewer's uh, owner's approval. The main tips for this is if you get it, nothing else, just get the first one. Treat them as any other uh, owner for code review. Uh, don't expect a rubber stamp once you've gotten everything else. Expect a thorough review. Uh, definitely don't TVR them. It's not okay to send the review to like to get others' approvals and then just TVR it for the for the uh, security owner's approval. And yeah, this can all be summed up into treat them as any other code reviewer. Include them promptly and expect a thorough review. Um, Another way that you'll interact with us is through security reviews. These are a part of the launch process when you're launching a new feature. Uh, and the, the main tip here is you want to reach out to Chrome Security early uh, to get any design advice or any big security questions out of the way. 
And this is particularly important for larger features or anything that spans multiple quarters, because we don't want you to uh, work on something, finish the design, and then realize that this design is not safe and we'll have to change, or much worse, uh, spend time implementing it before realizing that, that, that it is not safe. Uh, and I want to stress, even if you think that, there's, that you're working on something that's inherently dangerous and that there's no completely safe way to, to, to implement this feature, uh, I will still encourage you to talk to us. We might be able to find a way that's uh, either some form of compromise or even just a different way to implement this and, and, and turn it safe. So more so if you think that your feature is inherently dangerous, uh, talk to us early. Uh, so what are we looking for when we do those, UX, UX, those security reviews? Pretty much everything that I mentioned before on this presentation. For one, we're looking for any UX visuals and any flows and make sure that users have the information they, they, they need for, for anything that's security sensitive. Uh, we're looking for any new risks that might be introduced by this feature and whether they, they, the benefits outweigh the risks and how the risks are being mitigated. Secure transport just means we're looking for uh, usage of HTTPS for anything that we deem a powerful feature. Uh, we're looking for good testing. This includes like the regular unit and browser tests, and this also includes fuzzing, uh, that is adding test cases for cluster fuzz, which is particularly important if you're working on a parser or anything similar to that. And we're looking for what we call the rule of two. So what's the rule of two? Uh, so we have three things, untrustworthy inputs, an unsafe implementation language, and high privilege. You get to do two of those three, not all three. Uh, the one, one easy solution is to, if possible, is to get your code to run in a sandbox code that is in render processes as opposed to the browser process. That will get uh, the high privilege part out of the way and you'll be complying with the rule of two. Uh, a different one is to try to uh, make your inputs trustworthy. That is, uh, filter them or uh, validate them before running them. Uh, this can be tricky depending on what inputs are because inherently anything that you're getting from, from the open web will be uh, untrustworthy. So talk with the security team if you're not sure if you're validating away all the dangerous cases. Uh, the other part of the, the, the other one of those three things is unsafe implementation language. Unfortunately, C++ will be a, an unsafe implementation language, so there's no way to get rid of that part while working in Chrome, with the exception of some Android feature, Android only features where uh, the code can run just in Java code, in which case we could work uh, with, without the unsafe implementation language, but this is the minority of code in Chrome. Uh, so how to get approved when you're work how to get approved quickly when you're working on a, on a security review? Uh, for one, we need the design doc, and we if if, we're if you're sending any UI, we need mocks. Uh, so we appreciate if you if you point us to those when you're running through the review process. Uh, if you're working on a new open web platform API, then we also need a link to the spec uh, to, the, to the spec proposal or the spec change. And both your design doc and the spec change, if applicable, should have a security considerations process uh, section. That is, try to document any risks that you already know are part of your feature and any mitigations that you've already taken uh, for those. Uh, in general, documenting the risks, finding the risks is job of the security team when doing the review. But if you help us by providing us a pointer to those and telling us what you've already considered, uh, then uh, we can make this smoother for everyone. And finally, show good use for security for existing security mechanisms. Uh, one of those is having a, a parser, having a fuzzer if you're if you're writing a new parser, uh, making sure again that you have all tests for anything that you're running that will catch any bugs uh, early, and and just in general, show good use of all the recommendations that I talked about here. <laughs>